Nice. All right, folks, thanks for joining. Um, it's 7.32, and I'm going to try to keep these things to an hour, and we'll see how that goes. Um, let's see. Where's my PowerPoint going? Somebody stole it. Uh, let's see. Come on. There we go. All right. So this is our second um, webinar series. Oh, Will's coming back in. So we are we are recording uh, just so we can keep a record of it, and that always helps me figure out whether uh, um, it makes sense for for folk. Um, we are. Starting, so my name is Tom Turner. For some of you, um, we are friends in soccer for various periods of time. I think Delhi, you and I go back the furthest out of this group. As I'm looking, you know, Vince and uh, Will, Stephen, Harvey, friends, and the rest of you, I think are all new. So welcome, nice to meet you. Uh, that's what I do. I work for Ohio Soccer Association as the uh, Director of Member Growth and Development. I've worked with U.S. Soccer since 1993 as an instructional staff and with Ohio University, I think, I'm on my 12th course, so I'm not sure if that's six years or, it's not 12, but anyway. Um, and I've worked at the high schools, at colleges, worked on the regional ODP level, been with youth national teams, um, keep busy. And, so Ohio Soccer Association, that is our, our vision, but the, the, the piece that this fits in is the idea of the mission to, to support and inspire those of you who want to get better, which is signaled by the fact that you've joined tonight. My job is, is to help you. So if there's anything I can do to help you, um, you just reach out and we will find a way to make that work. But that's really just part of my, my job description is... is um, helping communities that want to help themselves. And the piece that's important for this is the idea of player retention and what the soccer experience is for players. I'm going to pick Ken Long. Can I pick on you? Because I, we don't know each other. What's that 70% um, for? Any idea? Um. The dropout rate. Beautiful. So we lose about 70% of our kids and we, we're probably not going to get that to 30%, but is there a possibility that we could keep more kids in sport? And part of that is the environment that, that we create, which is why we're doing the things we're doing. U.S. soccer a few years ago came out with a pretty bold statement that said, we want to make soccer the preeminent sport in the United States. Now that's pretty important. That's that's a pretty high bar. Um, but as far as our part of that is just the notion of what can we do with coaches to create better environments for players so that we can improve the retention rates. And from that, we will get better players. So it's we clearly have done well on the women's side. We've, we've been world champions four times. Um, the men at least are at a point where we're now going to compete, but that's just on the national level. And, and the, the bigger, broader mission is what can we do to get more players playing and more players staying in the game? How many of our kids don't become adult soccer players? So it's more about a global approach to this rather than just can the men and women win World Cups. It's, it's a lot more about participation because that's clearly where we get to become the preeminent sport. So that's part of what we do is part of what we're uh, doing tonight is trying to figure out ways that we can change things as coaches. So the webinar series, this is number two, how the rectangle can change soccer. And then I'm going to try to steer a little bit away from positional coaching because that is going to be the theme for the December session. Um, and then we'll get into some of the research in January about understanding players that builds a little bit into the fun maps and then a little bit about teaching. So we'll, we'll try to hit various components of this process through the, the six webinars, the six months. All right, we're off and running. 
the chat room quickie number one if you could stick in the chat room what do we have control over when we show up for practice and these relate to the variables because we're going to deal with the idea of the rectangle and what can, what can we do in rectangles so for those who were registered before i sent out um a little um tutorial on this but Anyway, let, let's see what we get. So what when we show up for practice, what variables do we have control over that we can manipulate in practice? And these are the pieces that are gonna we're gonna play with within the rectangles. We definitely do. <laughs> Cadence, okay, tasks. So Stephen has started to hit the, the variables, the numbers and the space. All of the other things we definitely do in terms of our attitudes, number of players participate in the space, the goals, S Nate, time, true Scott. All right, so let's move it along. The, the pieces that we do have control over, and we got some of these. We, we can control the number of players that play. We can control the organization so that if we want to get a little bit more structured with the positional uh, games, then clearly that's something we have control over. We can control how players score goals. And there's a variety of ways that that can happen that, that changes the tactical demands. We can certainly change the field space, size of it and the shape of it. Uh, the amount of time that people are playing and the amount of time they're resting, we have control over that. And then any conditions and playing rules, that would be the, the, the fifth piece here. So those are the elements that we have control over. And by manipulating those, we, we can do just about everything within a, a rectangle in a game of soccer. So the next one, for those of you who've taken a US soccer class, Goran Tomic, you cannot answer this. <laughs> Take a guess, um, if, if you've taken a US soccer class, uh, see if you can remember what the five elements are. If you've never taken a US soccer class, just sit tight. Vince Coleman, Vincent, let's see how many of these you can get. Oh, Tom, you caught me off. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, we'll let you simmer. We just did this. <laughs> All right, let's see um, anybody you go first. Organization, I, I think. Yeah. Well okay. done. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can just sit there knowing that you got the first one, Vince, unless see if anybody else can, can help you along here. Awesome. <laughs> so we're seeing. All right, let's put it up here. Well done, Vincent. So always with, with practice organizations, are they organized becomes a really, really important first step. And that relates to the number of players we've got, the amount of space that we're using for the players, um, whether we've got goals in the plays, balls are organized, that the players understand how to get it going. There's a lot goes into organized more than just what it seems. So then the next piece is, is it game-like? And this comes back to what players enjoy. Uh, if it's a drill, and, and I'm not going to make any bones about this, the, the less we can do that look like drills, the more fun players are going to have. Uh, is there repetition? Meaning that if we set out to develop support and play around the ball, keep in possession, does the exercise we put out actually create repetition? That's a really important uh, assessment piece for us. The fourth one is really relating to fun. If, if the games are lopsided, the kids just don't enjoy them. So really a part of our, our mission, I think, as coaches is to make sure that the games are close enough that everybody enjoys competing because then there's going to be a little bit of an adrenaline rush. The last part is the bonus piece, and we're not necessarily going to get too far into is there coaching tonight, but the message, I think, given your experiences and, and we're probably in different places on, on the, the webinar, for those of you who haven't done a lot of coaching, just satisfying the first four, you've probably done a great job with players because now you've got an environment that kids will just enjoy. They show up to practice, they play, and you may or may not be able to help them play any better, but 
they're at least enjoying playing soccer. If you've got then the ability to influence what they do because of your experience and you can coach them, then we can go to the next level. But just in terms of what at least kids will, will report as fun, those first four are really important. Is it, is it organized? Does it feel like a game? Am I getting repetition? Am I, am I finding ways to win? And those are really important for players. All right. So the next thing I'd like you to do, and I'm moving through this pretty quick because I want to spend the bulk of the time on what's coming from this. I think I asked those of you who were registered for the previous webinar to think about what kind of drives you nuts when you go to practice and you really you want to fix X and it doesn't come off. You just it drives you nuts and it frustrates and the kids maybe get a little frustrated and they're confused. But what is it about your experience in coaching that you've had frustrations trying to help players get better at? And it doesn't matter where, how, um, how trivial you think some of these things are because everybody will, will have the same issues to some degree. So in the chat room, if you could, what do you wish your players could do better that you've probably had some frustration in coaching? Uh, Sudi, you probably need to explain that a little bit more. Um, again, same thing, Scott. What does that mean specifically for us that we can train? Let's see, just kicking the <laughs> All right, the kids who boot the ball away, right? Um, okay, so let's go back. So we've got the kickers, right? And uh, we've got the people that listen to direction passing, um, spreading out, uh, support. Uh, Nathan, I'm gonna I'm, I'm I'm gonna be a little bit. This is intended for humor, so don't take it too seriously. What's the objective of the game? You score goals, of course. Okay. <laughs> so it's not such a bad thing when players want to score goals, but so a little, be a little bit more specific with me. What is it that you want them to pass the ball more? Yeah, look, finding the open person and <clears throat> not running and getting double and triple teamed and trying to dribble through two and three players when there's right. people standing open. So this is a support spacing kind of a frustration for you. And that same thing with Steve, Steve bunching around the ball. Okay, excellent. Let's see what else we've got. Vincent is on here. Vincent is Vincent Coglin moving off the ball. Okay. Uh, turning away from pressure. So that would be possession. And that would be for, and that's dribbling related. Okay, these are great. These will keep us busy for a while. Turning away from pressure, spacing, awareness around them, listening, applying those directions. Too much dribbling into contact. Okay, better passing. Not being afraid to make mistakes, even link. Okay, that's. These are actually coming into some of these other webinars. So these would be great conversations. So that's good. Uh, the idea of combination play. Um, ball control. All right. Um, marking. Oh, Stephen, you've just hit a tough one. <laughs> um, we may or may not get to that because that's actually going to be a really good conversation. Communication. All right. Um, Vincent smiling. <laughs> I have players that want to do rainbow flicks and bicycle kicks in games. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to just digress a little bit, Scott, and it's kind of great that we've got Delhi with us. Um, Delhi works in Akron with a group called the Akron Inner City Teams, and it's a lot of immigrant kids. And I always bring them into coaching schools any chance I get. So we had a C course about two years ago. And one of the kids, he was playing right back and he rainbowed his way out of the back. <laughs> you know why? Because he could. 
Um, and it was really funny because the coaches are sitting there, they're kind of gobsmacked. And clearly you don't expect kids to rainbow out of the back. But just the fact that he had the audacity to do it was quite funny. Um, if I'm not mistaken, George Weah, who is Timmy Weah's dad, scored a goal in the Bundesliga by rainbow and somebody at the top of the box and hitting the ball as it came over his head before it volleyed. But it's just, it's one of those conversations that we can have later, but it's, um, I, I get where you're going, but it, 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 it was fun. All right, vision. Uh, transition in general, okay, that's okay too. If they could, I would not. <laughs> Yeah, I get you, Steve. Scott. All right. So let's go to this one. And this is where we are going to go and pick some. Let's see if we can start off with, let's start with support. Because passing, passing and supporting are part of the same animal. And... What I'm going to do... And please feel free to chip in with whatever you would like to chip in with at any point. Um, ask, why that? Why are you doing this? What does this mean? I don't understand where you're going with that. Can you clarify this? How about this? So I'm going to come from the standpoint that everything we're trying to do is inside a game. And if we want to look at support, so can I ask which one of you, and I can probably look at the, chat but who who said support somebody who said support please come on i'm looking i'm looking i'm looking better passing so delhi was into passing and jeff brody i think spacing and, and awareness around them probably relates to support bunching around the ball stephen does for sure nathan passing and sharing the ball for sure and jeff spreading out so what ages are we talking about because that becomes important any one of you U11. U11, right? So we'll start with U11. So U11's game is 99. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just realizing there's a couple of things that I needed to hold on. Let me back up a little bit. I'm going to stop here. And there's a couple of things I wanted to bring up before I got to this. Sorry. Okay, let me just flip and we'll come back. So here's where I was going with that, why I asked you. The first thing we look at is age. But the next thing we look at is motivation and experience. And I'm not going to list through this because I'll send you the, the, the PowerPoint afterwards. I'll post it. But generally, the kids in the first box, I'm not sure what to do with as, as a coach. That Those are the kids that Frankly, I'll just tell them to go sit around. And if you want to join in because you see something you like, come and join in. But when we've got kids who are in the second box, and for sure the kids in the third box, we can work with that level of play of the second and the third tier. The third tier are the kids who are committed. The third tier are probably the ones who leave their friends locally and go find the best competition they can. The kids in the middle are probably just still sampling the game. And that's okay too. But those are the ones that we've got the best chance to work with. Um, and you can read through and see where you, what you think of that. Just as general concepts, and this is why I was asking, typically we use sixes. It's really just about them and their ball. By the time they get to U8, we can start to get them to open up and share the ball. This is a generality. There are clearly kids always ahead of the curve. So at U8, the main theme is, is what we're going to talk about here, which is support. How do you get kids to share the ball, move away from each other, and not bunch? And that's sort of the starting expectation is that they will do that, but can we get them over the period of time we're working with them to, to get away from each other and share the ball? So that's why age is important, because intellectually they're, they're young, but they will follow... Um, they will take some initiative and they will learn relatively quickly. So by the time I get to U10, now we're talking about playing around the ball and this increases the numbers. U12 is typically playing away, creating space in three lines. Uh, we can see a lot more of that. Uh, there are some groups that play 
are far ahead of their age group. Some groups that still look like U10. That's just the fact that we have to look at the kids and see how they match up to any of these general themes. And then 14s plus is team development, U11, 11 to 11 and older. So the general skill progression then for U6s is really just about dribbling the ball and kicking the ball, shooting. That, that should be the mentality. It's not about playing left wing when you're five. It's just about the ball. At U8, they're going to share the ball to some degree, which also means they have to receive it. But there's also dribbling, there's also shooting. When they get to U10, they're going to pass the ball over a relatively short distance. They may start to receive the ball on the bounce, perhaps out of the air, as long as it's not coming at their head. And they, the old, In the old days, they would head it, but that typically becomes a U12 concept. They'll pass the ball a longer distance. What we'll find is that by the time kids get to U12, they're, they can almost, almost do every skill in the book. The top U12 players are really pretty talented kids. And uh, the one I know who's working with clubs that have got a, a range of players, Will, would, would, you, would you say that's true of a very small number of your kids or a reasonable number of your kids at U12? Very small number in my program, um, a reasonable number in our, um, in our upper tier programs. Okay. And that, that's fair, right? The, the more motivated kids are probably practicing on their own, but they can really demonstrate a significant range of skills. So U12 is a pretty significant age in terms of how the game gets played uh, and then older. So that's a, um, a structure that I think I'm going to keep in mind as we wander through tonight. The second piece relates back to why I was asking about the ages. If we know the ages and we know the ability and we know the motivation, it has an impact on the type of games that are going to help them get repetition. And I've broken this down into three sort of general thoughts. If we're dealing with skill game, just application of technique, typically we want to keep it 1v1 to somewhere in a ballpark of 4v4. Because that way you get a lot of repetitions and it's not too crowded. When we get into games of 4v4, 5v5, 6v6, and perhaps 7v7, we're starting to develop positional awareness as a primary reason for putting those games in that form. When we get to 7v7 and larger, the only reason to put those games is to make the team play better as a team. Because there's no reason to put an 8v8 game on when you're dealing with technique, it's too big. So if it's a technique piece, a skill piece, which is, includes defenders, the smaller the numbers, the more the repetition. So as a general framework for coaching, all the technical slash skill pieces go down at the bottom. The positional games tend to be needing a little bit of structure. And, and I'm going to stretch this as need be tonight, maybe to 4v4, but we'll, we'll take it one, one piece at a time. And then anything above 7v7 is really about building a team. What part of, of the soccer game as a game do I want to teach them? So those are the bigger games. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going back to where, we, where I got derailed there. And we will go to, all right, so we're back to this. So the idea of support. So Nathan, you said U11s, and would you say they spread out well or they tend to clump? Uh, I would say they're starting to get the <clears throat> idea of spreading out on the field. Okay. At this point. Starting to, right? So I'm going to throw a couple of examples up. So the first thing we need is, is goals because goals are just good motivation. So I'm going to make this as quick as I can. We could put any pugs you want to do, but I'm just going to make this simple. And I'm going to throw this out, right? And then at the other side, the other team also has something to score in. Hey, where are you going? What happened there? I'm not sure what just happened there. Hold on. That's never happened. Oh, there we go. No, I do know what happened. Ooh. All right, I've had um, I've had a technical issue here. I'm not quite sure what it did. Let me go back to. I think I might. I think I might have closed my program. Did I? I did. Shoot. Screen sharing. Uh, at this point, all we can see is each other, right? Yes. 
right? Because I think I hit a button and, and closed my um, my program there. So let me bring it back up. Come on. Oh, here we go. All right. Okay, we're in. All right, we're back. Sorry about that. So, whoa. Now it just disappeared. Okay, now I don't quite know what just happened. Uh, uh, why would that disappear on me? I'll try one more time and then I'm going to have to go to figure out what I'm doing next. So I've got... Hey, Tom, my guess is I think the last two times you tried to make it big, it, cr it crashed your app. So just leave it normal size, see if that right. fixes it. Let's try that. Good. Best suggestion I've got. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna keep it smaller. Can we see that? Yes? Yep, we can see All it. Right. Yep. Okay, here we go, let's try again. So I need some goals. And I'm gonna just simply put two at each end. All right. And then we need some players. So we will take some, come on, kitties. Uh, I just crashed. Wow. All right. I'm going to have to go to another way to do this. Um, give me a second. Eek. Best laid plans of mice and men. Um, shoot, here we go. Sorry, people, I haven't had that happen to me before. Let me explain the game while I'm looking at this thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two goals at each end, and then I've got a choice in the middle. I'll play 2v2, 3v3, 2v2 plus 1. And if I make the goals one touch, somebody want to take a, a, a shot at what that does for my game? Oh, dear. So is the question that you can only score off a of one touch? Mm -hmm. so it, to me, it means that you can only score from a pass. Good. So what does that mean for the game itself? That we're starting to combine. Yep, that we're starting to um, get, you know, um, hopefully our eyes up. We're looking to make that pass and um, so we're, we're incorporating more than just ourselves okay. into the game. Okay. Player, players without the ball will be forced to move off the ball to get into position to support the ball. Good. That's part of it too. I think I've found one I might be able to use here. Anything else? It'll create more passing. It definitely will create more passing. I'm looking for... Uh, 
I've got a PowerPoint. I'm, what I'm looking for is, got it. All right. This is not this is going to help me a little bit. No, it's not. Shoot. Uh, folks, I'm sorry about this. I'm going to give my uh, program one more shot here. This is probably the uh, definition of lunacy, right? Insanity. All right, one last shot at it, fingers crossed. So if I simply have goals, two on each side, And we play 2v2 plus 1. Let's just take 2v2 plus 1 and we'll do a couple of variables. How long is that game? So let's just leave it at that. We'll play 2v2 plus 1 inside. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead here. Okay. First of all, how long would we play? How big is the field? Mark, you want to have a bash at it? 2v2, how big is my field? You can always pass. Oh, James. Yeah, Tom. Yes. I, yeah, how about a quarter of a full field? All right. Okay, that's a, that's a starting point. We have um, we have a suggestion: quarter of a full field. Put, let's put that in yards, Delhi. What do you think for yards? All right, there's what the little game looks like. So far, it hasn't crashed. <laughs> All right. So let me give you a little bit of a help on this one. If you've got two players, typically you want about 20 yards, 10 yards in length per player. So if we've got three, it might be about 25 because the other team still only got two. Generally, when you're looking at a field space, the width, sorry, the, the width is, is two thirds of the length. So if we're gonna go, let's just say it was a 30 yard field, the width would be 20. In this case, it's a 25 yard field. So the width would be about two thirds of 25, maybe 16, 18. So we've got a field space that works. The next question we're gonna ask is, how long do we play so that we can keep the enthusiasm? It doesn't mean it's the only, we only play one round, but we wanna control the amount of time that they're playing so that they can rotate, they can rest while they're rotating, they can go play another team. Because if we've got, 15 players at practice, then here are five players. So we got five, 10, 15, three games. So we set up three games. So how long would we want to play? Tony Benichick, take a guess. You've got between one and 90 minutes. 2v2. I'd say uh, four or five minutes. Okay. Um, Vincent, what do you think? Sorry, cooking. Um, or two v two. How long would you two v two? Yeah. Uh, say about thirty seconds. Ooh. Okay. Chris Davis, what do you think? I'd say about two minutes. Two minutes. All right, we're getting closer, and, and uh, in some ways, that's a good start point. And then we just simply ask the players, is two minutes too short, too long? And they will give us a pretty accurate idea of how long to play. But generally, it's two minutes per uh, one minute per player as the starting point, which can always get a little shorter or longer based on all sorts of factors. So typically, we would play this on a field at about 25 by 18 maybe 
um, we play about two minute rounds and we rotate the kids. And because I've got a condition on it that says one touch goals, the objective was to get the kids to support around the ball. And because the kid just can't dribble a ball forward and score all the time, they have to pass it if they've taken a touch. And if they have to pass it, they clearly have to keep possession of it. So we start to get into some of these other issues that were raised, which is um, there are multiple skills that get developed when you put games in soccer formats and just give the kids a way to play. So any questions about the organization? Jeff Rohde, can I pick on you again? Please. How would, can you think of a way that we could get this organized efficiently? You mean like for 15 players? No, just, just in terms of getting one game organized. So I want to, I want to show the kids how we can get this game organized. How do we get it started? Do we stand on the side and we tell the kids what to do or is there a more efficient way to get any of these games started? I usually grab a, a few of the, the sharper kids who understand and jump in there myself with them and try to try to display what, what we're trying to achieve. Love it. All right, so you put them on the field and you say, red team, you score by kicking through these two goals here, the orange goals. White team, you score by kicking through the blue goals. Kid who's a neutral, you can score for and play for both teams. Um, this works fine with U11s. It probably goes south pretty quick with U8s because U8s don't understand neutrals. But typically U9 and above, you can get kids to, to make this happen pretty quickly. All right. Um, let's take another game. So we've dealt with, the, uh, this is support. Let's try the idea of vision. Because vision is an important piece, and to me, it's the, the really an important tactical part of the game. That if the kids don't really understand how to look before the ball comes, they really don't play very quickly. So there's our two goals. I'm going to take these away. So there's something that, that I have always used as a, as a teaching tool, which is you've got two ways to teach something as a condition. You can either reward it or you can penalize it. So let's just say we've got three kids in this game and one of them's a goalkeeper. So we'll stick the kid in as a goalkeeper, make them red, we'll put this kid back here, make that kid white. All right, it's good. Okay, let's go to 3v3 and make it a little bit bigger. So we'll add one more red. We'll add one more white. All right, so we have a game that's goalkeeper. We'll just stick these kids in different shirts so that the union doesn't get upset. All right, so the goalkeeper. So how many players do we have on each team? Four. How, many, how many players four okay so the objective was vision can can whoever said vision can you explain to us what you were thinking about and what you've tried to do to make it better and not had much success with it Go back to the handy can dandy chat and vision came up from vision, vision, vision. Who said vision? Kelly. Kelly, what do you mean by vision? Uh, by vision number one, uh, playing on the red team. Don't don't take the ball and run to go straight to the player in white. Okay. So you, Abby, right. So you want the kids to pick their head up before the ball comes. Right. Okay, simple, good. 
I'm glad I I'm glad I picked up on that. All right. What if the goalkeeper had the ball and that was what the goalkeeper saw for his or her three teammates? Stephen Palmer, what would you say to the three kids in red if the goalkeeper had the ball and that's what the goalkeeper saw? Well, you can you can always pass. Oh. Yeah, from a from a goalkeeper perspective, it would be finding that space wide for the guys that are there. For the no, no, just just stop with the reds though, because look at the position of the reds. What are the reds looking at? Oh, I see. You're saying they're they're facing away from the ball. Yes. So if we can get kids to start to play, in this case, like that. And in this case, like this. So now the, the kids are half turned and we'll just forget about the forward at the moment, but now the kids on the side are now half turned. And if they just turn and look up, they can see whether they're, they're marked or not. So Delhi, I think that's what, where you were going with this, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. So here's where the referee comes in, and this is why good use of conditions. I always coach with a whistle in my back pocket. And it's one of the first things you always deal with with kids is if you don't look before the ball comes, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to keep possession if there's anybody in the vicinity, or you're going to play slowly because you don't see what your options are before the ball comes. So my response to this is simple. If the ball comes to any one of the players and they have no idea what's behind them, it's a foul. I just simply blow the whistle, point in the opposite direction, and give the other team five seconds to get the ball back in play. And what that does is it forces kids to look before the ball comes. It, it gives me a chance to encourage them to turn their bodies before any balls are played to them, particularly when it started from the goalkeeper. And the, the, which, which positions have the tougher challenge in this? Let me be a little bit more um, obvious. Between the forwards and the midfield players and the defenders, which ones typically are not playing, are playing with their back to goal? The attackers. Good. So anybody who's in the front half of the team are going to be playing with their back to goal. They have the tougher task than the kids who play at the back of the team who are facing forward. Now, it, it, what we have to be careful of is not making a rule that doesn't make any sense. For example, if you don't turn and play the ball forward, it's a foul. Well, clearly, if a kid's under pressure, the smart thing to do is not play forward, but keep the ball. What I'd like them to do before they get the ball is at least be aware that they've got pressure in the vicinity so that their first touch goes to a place they can keep possession. Does that mean they can't turn and go forward? No. Nope. All I'm asking is that when players play, their heads are looking to the point where they're aware of what's around them. So just a simple, now I become the referee. I don't become the coach. I just pull out the whistle. And when the kids don't look before, then it's a foul. Simple, simple, simple. So that's a really effective way to get a game going. Um, I can do it within the context of a game and I can do a lot of good teaching simply by being a referee. Now, there's another way to look at it, which is I'm going to give the kids a point if they turn. However, if most of the kids don't do something, I need to make it a priority and so I'm going to put the negative rule in there rather than the positive one. Let me give you an example of the other way around. If a kid played a first time pass because they can see where they're going and they can play, they've got the technique to play first time. I might give those extra points. I'm not going to make the kids play first time because clearly the game doesn't make any sense to play one time passes a lot of the, in many cases, but in a game like this, if they played a first-time pass, which increases speed of play, 
it would be a good example of a positive reinforcement. So goals are worth three points. Always goals are worth more than anything else because the objective is to score goals. Maybe you play first team to 10 points, whatever. And one touch passes gets you an extra point. So you can always play within the game and have additional scoring conditions that try to get the kids to play a little bit quicker, a little bit smarter. But ultimately, it's still a game of soccer played between two goals. Um, I've got a 4v4 game. Michael Coughlin, at 10 yards per player, how long is this field? See if, you, see if you're th- remembering from before. How many yards per player? Uh, was it t- 10 yards, 40 yeah. yards? Bingo. And then how wide would it be at 40 yards long? 30. Good. So there we go. We've got a field space of 40 by 30. We're playing 4v4. Mike, you, you want to go for the, the sentence here? How long are we playing, roughly? Uh, eight minutes. How many players on the field? Uh, eight. 44. Uh, okay, I, I see where you're going with that. All right, good point. It's it's on one one team. Yeah, that, oh, that's man. actually no, – no, your logic makes total sense. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Four, four minutes then. <laughs> so it's a four-minute game, which could be five – could be three but but four minutes is good and that gives us a starting point to then figure out if i'm going to go shorter or longer at any point excellent okay so now we've got a simple game that we can go referee all i'm looking for is calling fouls when the kids don't look so a good example of um just how the game gets structured in a way that um can still always feel like soccer All right, let's try something else. Um, Let's look at the thought that the idea of playing forward early. And for this one, I'm going to take the goal out. And we've got four players, so I'm okay. And I'm going to put this to look like this. This, This kid is red. So what I'm going to do is play a game to targets. I'm going to stick the kids on the end, and I'm going to play 2v2 in the middle. And they, they, So if I wanted the kids to look forward and play early, what would the scoring rule be? Uh, is that Dong Hai? Tell me I, I haven't butchered your name. Dong Hai? Maybe? Matt, you with us? Deepen Brock? Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. If I wanted these kids to think about playing an early forward pass, how would I score? How would I let this game score? What, how do you score a goal? And are they playing out of the back? Yep. They, they, so I've got two players on the back. I got two players resting on the front, and I'm playing two v two in the middle. Yep. What do you? What, how do you think this would be structured so that the we can score goals? And the, see, I would probably say just getting it down to the other one of the other players, right? You're playing through the middle, so see if you can. Uh, just get it down to the other side. Good. And it's that simple. So if we play yeah. the game where the red team score by playing into the white team, now the white team have got a goal. Now the white team's job is to – this kid's facing the wrong way. It's all right. We'll bring another one in. All right. So now the teams flip around, and they look like this. So once you've scored, um, the objective once you lose the ball is to defend. And every time I'm, all the games that I've set up so far, you're attacking, you're defending, you're transitioning. Attacking, defending, and transitioning. So one of the comments that came up was, we got a lot of kids that don't react to the game. Now you have to think, well, do I let them, am I organizing games that have natural transitions between attacking and defending? And if one of the problems I have with my team is that they don't transition when we lose or win the ball, you have to ask how much time am I giving them playing games where that's just the natural response to the game. I either lose it and I got to try to win it back or defend 
or I win it and I try to counterattack or build up. Simple, simple thoughts, but the more, the more that those are natural components to the soccer game, the more likely it is that they're just going to realize we lose the ball, we try to win it back. We win the ball, what's the first thing you do? You try to score. So this is a classic example of a little game where the two players on the end are resting, the two players in the middle will play for a period of time. And Michael, this is the one I'm going to come back to you on because this is sort of a googly question. What would the typical time for a 2v2 game be? Uh, two minutes. Right. And this is one of those games where that goes out the window because it's quite an intense game. And so it, what I've found over time is that the kids will go for about a minute and I need to change them. It's a good example of, of a high intensity. Game. Anytime it's 1v1, 2v2, the one minute, two minute logic doesn't hold up the same way it does for 3v3, 4v4. And this is why it's always just really a, it's about us recognizing and getting comfortable with, with, with game forms over time so that we can match up the field space to the playing time. And I've got a, a repetition in here where I've got two players playing, two players resting. They just simply rotate after each minute. But the objective here is to find enough space that they can play forward. Um, what would be the best thing for this kid on the end to do when they got the ball? Quick one-touch pass back to his teammate. Um, think about the game. How did the white team score? Let's just, I'm going to make it obvious. What would be the best thing the kid on the end at the moment can do if the ball came to him or her? Pass in the space. Think one more step. Pass to, Pass the, end to the target. Line. Good. So if the ball was played all the way down here, that would be a goal. And a lot of times players will just mark players because, well, that's my job is to mark player. But no, your starting positions tend to be more in the middle because if the other team can score, now we've got to respect the fact that the ball can be passed from one side to the other. Now, I'd make it on the ground. However, what that does is it opens up space for these kids to get the ball if they just open up to the side or if they get stuck, if they just cross you know, a ball can get played in. And that's where the width becomes an important piece. If we make this a little bit too narrow, there's no space on the sides. And so manipulating the space of the field becomes important to, to open up the middle, um, but also open up space on the side. So some of you mentioned bunching and some of you mentioned off the ball movements. Let's just take this game and look at it this way. Is the advantage at the moment to the red team or the white team and why? The white team has numbers. Yep, they are 4v2 in that end of the field. But in terms of the white team's chances of scoring, other than the other, let's just say for argument's sake, the back players cannot score. So the ball has to come into the middle. The first thing we'd probably ask is what does that do tactically to the game? So I've taken away one of the scoring methods, which is the end players can't pass to each other. So the ball has to come into the middle. So what does that mean for the white players playing against the Reds? What, what tactic do they have to get practice at they to, need to, to win? They need to, move, they need to move into space and Excellent. move around. Excellent. So they have to find space away from their opponent. Otherwise, the ball is never going to come in. The other thing about this is that because they're stuck in the same part of the field, it's too easy for the Reds to defend. So just simply by, and I apologize, the kid's facing the wrong way, but that's all right. You get the idea. Just simply by opening up the game this way, now the movement of one player opens up space for another. So you start to get the idea of vertical or horizontal or lateral movement relative to the movement of a teammate. So for those of you who were talking about creating space, well, 
now you've got a game that's a simple game that's got really a lot of pieces to it. It's got passing, it's got receiving, it's got creating space, it's got about getting away from a defender, and still the objective is to attack and score goals. Simple little game. Let me move along. Um, right. Somebody mentioned the kid who was a kicker. <laughs> and we get those all the time. I'm going to put in small goals again. Let's just go to young kids and I'm going to play. Let's just take this kid out. Oh, yeah. I'll play 3v3. That's good. So we're playing 3v3. Take this kid. He's resting. He's on another field. A couple of goals in. Right? So a simple game, two goals. I've got a kid or kids who routinely just bash the ball down the field, kick it out of somewhere. So I'm going to become the referee in this game. What can I do to stop kids bashing the ball away? Megan, I know you claim last time you're not a coach, but I'm, I know you're, you're a smart enough woman. <laughs> can I pick on you for this one? Uh, sure, we can try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you've got a kid who bashes the ball away every time it comes to them mm -hmm. and you don't want them to bash the ball away, is there a rule I can put in the game that stops that kid bashing the ball away? Otherwise, they lose possession. Um, can they make sure that they do a pass to a player or that call out be, the player's name and pass it? I love it what you're doing, but that would be a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> the bonus would be keeping it. So I'm, I'm asking the kid to oh. actually take a touch. So think one step back is what you've, you've said is perfect. What could I? What rule could I put on this game that would that would really um, encourage the kids not to just whack it away? They have to dribble it. Uh, what do you need before you can dribble? Uh, if I kick the ball away, it? can I dribble it? Yes. Okay. okay. So I need a, <laughs> I need at okay. least I need at least two touches. Okay. So well done. All of those answers were, were, were made perfect sense. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> and, and so a simple thought, if you've got kids who bash the ball away, just make it a rule. You have to play two touch minimum. And now the kids can't kick it away. Simple, simple thought. So again, the goals are at both sides. I'm still playing within the rectangle. It's a 3v3 game. Come on, Michael, out of the bullpen. How big's my field space? How long am I playing? Michael Coughlin's my go-to guy tonight. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what, 30 by uh, 20, I guess. It gets a and clap, and how long are we playing? Three minutes. Yeah, nailed it. All right. So, <laughs> so we're playing three-minute rounds, 30 by 20. Goals are about maybe five yards apart. I'm going to make them big enough so that the kids will actually look to shoot uh, early enough. So maybe three to four yards across. And the simple rule in the game is you cannot play one touch. You have to take a first touch. And so for kids who bash the ball away, I'm just taking that away from them and I'm forcing them. Otherwise, it's a free kick. Simple, simple things. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm going down the list here. Passing, support, spacing, spreading out. Let's try this one for spreading out. It's getting into a little bit of, of, of next week, but that's okay. I'm going to put the goals back up again. Just forget I've got those poles in there. All right, I need a goalkeeper. And this is interesting. The girls don't want to play tonight. The boy, there's the girls. There we go. All right, come on, kids. Let's go play. Uh, so I've got a goalie, and we'll put the keeper in white, and got a goalie on the other side. 
and the keeper is in white, so we need a team that's in blue. Another team that's in blue. And I'm going to play with this kid in the front, and she's blue. All right. So if I spend my time as a coach encouraging those players to do that, and the ball is at this side, starting here, any idea what I might be oh, I might be teaching? This is like bonus round here. I'm going to put something else in. What would I be teaching if my coaching was at this point with the white team in possession, coaching the Reds to go and pick up a player? If I'm being defended by somebody, what do I have to do to be able to get the ball? Sudi, can you can you chip in on this one? What do you think? Well, it looks like you want them to open up. Uh, looks like you want uh, them to shield the defender out, uh, receive the ball in. Good. That's, that's fair. That's exactly what the point is. If you've got kids who don't play well under pressure, then we have to create the conditions where they're under pressure. So at this point, I have to flip my coaching around. And rather than looking at the blue team, I'm going to coach the red team when the opponent has the ball to go pick up. And when they go pick up, they're always going to be under pressure. So they have to find a way to get involved in the game. So that's one thing. The other thing is spreading out. And this is bleeding into next week a little bit, but I'm going to put it on here if I can find my, my lines. Oh, here. Yeah. So I'm going to put a line across the field this way. Make it bigger. All right. So there's a halfway line. And the rule in the game is this. The kids in the, that there are three people on each team, but all three of them can't be on the same side of the field together, nor can we have two balls. That's illegal as well. <laughs> right. So I've got, there we go. That's my game. I've got 4v4 game. And there are three field players. And two of them are on one side of the field. But I'm just to show you that it could happen. The game could look like this. So what's the rule? Mark Sanders or Scott Williams? What, what would be the rule in the game in terms of player movements? No response from Mark or Scott. All right. Anybody? You can't have three on one side. Good. Excellent. So this this becomes a foul, unless it's young kids, in which case I'm not going to get too bent out of shape about it. I'm just going to encourage them. But probably U9 and above, and this is a game, an elementary game for U9s, but that would be a rule that says if the ball goes to this player, for example, and he dribbles across, what does this player do? Would we want this player here if the goal is here and the ball is over here? What would be the natural thing for that player to do in the game? Shift over to support the ball. Excellent. All right. So now we shift this one. Basically, because this player, she can't go back because the rule says keep three players separate. She stays in that half. And now it's a 2v2 game in this half. If the ball gets intercepted and played forward, you can see why sometimes it's 2v1, sometimes it's 1v2, sometimes it's 2v2. But they've got these little games where just simply creating a condition in the game where all three can't be together, now we create we start to create balance in the team because if one player can't go forward, now we've got people who have to stay at the back of the team when their team's attacking. 
a kid plays in the front, so she has to stay forward so that we've got a chance to play forward and build. And, and now we've created space over here where it's a 1v1, 2v2 game. Um, what may or may not I decide to add in this game that would make it more or less realistic for you 9s, you 10s? Because I'm not, this is too small for you 11s, but let's just say you 9, you 10. What, or, what rule would I want to throw in here probably pretty quickly? Mark, if you want to put that in the chat, if you're, or Scott, if your mic's not working. Vincent, you've, you're illuminated. Would you like to add? Um, I was going to say a build-out line, but I don't know if that's right. Yeah, we don't need one at this yeah. point. No. Mm -hmm. What other rule are we probably missing that we would like to add in? Offside, thank you, Ken Long. Well done. So what we can do with these little games like this is only after the first ball forward. So for just this young lady here, if she wants to go and play maybe a little deeper on the field, there's no offside when that ball gets played forward. Now she's got room to move. Well, as soon as a teammate joins her, now we got a 2v1 perhaps, but now offside becomes a relevant factor because we don't want the kids just going and making runs that don't make any sense to the game. So we can change it and bring offside into the game, but just as an as a after the first ball is played forward. So we can restrict this game. And let me look at one last thing. If I force the ball to be passed over halfway. What does it force the forward to do? Check back to the ball. Good. And what if I let the players run with the ball? What would the forward's job be then? Find space. Good. So it changes the tactical situation. If this player's coming forward with the ball and they get a little bit of a counterattack, now all she has to do is get out, find space, and be on site. And now you got a 2v1. So, so it, it just naturally forces different tactical responses, but always I've got the context of a game. It's a 4v4 game, fields about 40 by 25, maybe 40 by 30 if you want to go there, four minute rounds, maybe three, and just rotate the goalkeepers after each round. But again, everything is, is this is starting to, Maybe a good time to stop because we're over time, but it's also starting to get into next week, which is the development of positional play. And now where do we go from this point as we start to get kids to help them understand what it means to play on the field in the position that they're assigned to or, or trying to figure out what that means. So I'll stop there because we're, we're done for time. Uh, any questions, comments? Tom, is this going to be posted on the website somewhere? It is. Because I was unable to join from the beginning because we had practice. Yep. No, I'm going to put this on. We can see the rest. That's it. We've we've taken a vet. Oh, that just died. I wonder what's going on here. Maybe it's just something with the uh, program. Who knows? Anyway. So let me let me flip this around. Take away from tonight anything that is resonating with you. Michael, what are you not going to forget about tonight? <laughs> Sizing of the fields. <laughs> you, you were brilliant out of the bullpen there. <laughs> you became the starting pitcher. <laughs> Sudi, anything? Yeah, I just... Had some really good thought starters about um, the movement, um, and then the the second and third movement. Um, just following along with you got my brain moving a little bit. I had to write it down so I wouldn't forget it. Beautiful, Ellie. You started this off. Anything for you? Oh yes. Um. Uh, really, the batching. In fact, I wrote some kids' name. You know, all they do is just kick the ball, kick the ball. And I would say, come on, just touch it one or two. And you, you know, you, you repeat at it. 
and reinforce it. I really like that. Thank you. And my whistle is always my best coach. I don't have to say anything. I just point my finger. Sorry, you kicked it away. Foul. <laughs> yeah. Well, anything for your, because I'm assuming you're in here because you're looking at stuff to do with your coaches. What are the challenges you see with the, the group of coaches you're working with that are, is interesting, maybe? I, what I took away from it, no, I think what all coaches struggle with is we, we try to be too complex. We, we try to squeeze so much in and, and try to bring so much to the table that the kids lose um, side of the game. And, and so do we. Uh, so what I like about what you did is it's, it's a simple setup and you get out of it what you need in just a few little changes, yeah. as Deli said, right? Okay, so now it's two touch and all of a sudden the kids whacking the ball are being settled, right? It's, you know, a, a subtle change to what you're using as goals um, versus targets. And now you change um, the impact of, of passing, um, you know, versus dribbling. And uh, so I think that's, we, we all just need to be mindful of that, that the game doesn't need to be so complex. Implicitly, I say the, the game, the activities, the yeah, activities yeah. don't need to be so complex. Yeah, Any other takeaways from anybody? Thank you for, for Sudi, Deli and, and Will, just thoughts. Otherwise, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm wasting your time and you'll never get the hour and 15 minutes back again. <laughs> I would just say having counter goals and making the game realistic so the kids have to transition and play defense quickly as well. So, Let me ask you, Matt, was there any game that didn't have goals for both teams? Uh, no, not that I can recall. Yep, so they had to... I joined, but I joined late too because I yeah, yeah. we okay. can't practice. So yeah, so so everything that um, everything that I play, I, I rarely go for one goal and then counter attacks. I'm I'm always trying to figure out how can I coach things between two goals, and that doesn't mean it's the only way to do things. And there's clearly other parts of coaching that um, always find their place. Um, I think as a general message, particularly for the moms and the dads who are volunteering and sometimes for the people who are coming out of it from the game, but think as, as Deli and Will said, we, we have to get complicated to be good. Many, many times we just need to be simple to be good, but we have to know what we're looking for. And I, I think there's another, there's another part of this equation as we move forward as a soccer culture, which is I have a suspicion we don't coach in games because we haven't spent enough time just being comfortable understanding what games bring. And so we tend to do a lot of drill coaching because it seems like it's more organized. It seems like it's more quote unquote coaching. And then when the games start, we fold our arms and say, well, I'm done. We got to the point where I did my drills and now we're playing games. And the more we understand about how games can be really a fun and be really useful for teaching things, the more we can shift the culture towards game play as opposed to drill, 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 shut my arms and let's play for five minutes because everybody did my drills. So it, it's it's not necessarily a natural transition to coaching within games because people have to know what they're looking for, but it's not that difficult because there's a lot of overlap within games where you get pretty much a range of, of skills, techniques under pressure, which is skill. And then it's just a question of what do I want to get repetition at? Do I want to get repetition at shooting? Well, stick a couple of goals in there. Do I want to get repetition at passing and pick an early ball? Maybe it's the targets. Um, do I want to get repetition at playing under pressure? Make sure the defenders are defending better. And so we, we can build a lot of skills in, in smaller games with a lot of repetition before we have to worry necessarily about positional play. Um, and that's sort of the message of, is there's, there's, there's skill games and then there's positional games. And there is a difference in terms of why we would use one versus the other. They're complementary, right? Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that next month. So if there's no other last questions, we've gone 20 minutes over, but I don't care if you want to stay on and chat anybody, I'll stay here all night. So <laughs> otherwise, I really appreciate everybody joining. Um, I'll, I will post this. I'll send it to you. I've got note of who was here um uh, and i'll let i'll let you know it's posted and you can go find it if there's any questions feel free to ask but um but we're done thank you
Anybody wants to stay out? Cheers, Thank to you. Night, everybody. Thanks, Ali. <laughs> See you, Will. Hey, Will, your coat's in the mail. Friday. <laughs> I saw that. Is it, did Gordon walk off without it as well? No, he was going to Scotland and he thought, you know, you may as well just mail this. So I got it in this little box. It looks like you've got a new okay. ring, but it's actually your coat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I appreciate it. So it was it was great. And uh, I love this stuff. I, I think we're going to try and figure out how to get more. I had sent out an invitation specifically to all of our coaches, but I, I got it out there late. And um, I think we're going to try and get more of them on board. And if you're OK with it, I will probably for those who don't get it, I'll probably you know, replay it for them um, in, you know, a separate session. Maybe I, I talked about maybe doing some some coffee shop talks with them and just having them go through it. Um, it's not as just, good we can when they can't up, interact. Just, why don't we just set one up and do one with the club coaches? Yeah. You set it up separate. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, for two I'm, hours. You got, you got people that okay. are, I'm, I'm assuming there's some, some moms and dads that come into these things who, they're not going right. to spend two hours, but if you've got a club where you've got a little bit more um, vested in terms of their uh, professionalism, um, not their enthusiasm, but professionalism, I mean, we could go two hours and we could do the same kind of conversation, but right. whatever you want, just let me know. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's perfect. So um, have a good Thanksgiving, Tom, and uh, too. I will see you soon. Thanks. All right, thanks, mate. Michael, you and I staying for more talks? Sorry, sorry, Dom. No, I was just, uh, I was just looking.